In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray in the words our Savior taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome back to the program, Learning to Live in God's Divine Will. A program on the writings of the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta. Luisa Picaretta, an Italian instrument of God to bring to the church and the world the restoration of the union of wills as enjoyed by Adam and Eve before sin, and Jesus and Mary who knew no sin, um, was a woman without much learning. God chose her for that reason, so that she would set us an example to follow, that of humility, lowliness, self-abasement. This is really the way to receive the gift through humility and these qualities. Now, now, by way of introduction, I mentioned Louisa because I would like to talk to you about her doctrines, the doctrines of Jesus Christ, really, through her writings, on this Christmas occasion. We are in the Christmas season now, and in my previous talk, I went through very briefly the nine excesses of love that Louisa recited every day from the age of 17 on. Okay. And what I'd like to share with you are the Christmas reflections taken from various extrapolations of her writings and then go into more detail on the excesses of love in the nine days preceding Christmas. This passage of Christmas Day 1900, written by Louise in her fourth volume, allows us to enter into the spirit of Christmas. She writes, As I was in my usual state, I felt my soul outside my body. And after having made my rounds, I found myself inside a cave where I saw the Holy Queen Mother in the act of giving birth to the little baby in Jesus. What an amazing miracle. It seemed that both our mother and her son were transfigured in the purest light. In that light, one could easily see the human nature of Jesus contained within the divinity itself. The human nature of Jesus contained the divinity within itself and that his human nature served as a veil to clothe his divinity. It appeared such that if one were to remove the veil of his human nature, he could be revealed as God. But as long as he remained clothed with the veil, he appeared as a man. Here is the miracle of miracles. God and man, man and God without leaving the Father and the Holy Spirit, as true love never permits separation. He comes to dwell among us, taking upon himself human flesh. Now it seemed to me that during this most happy event of the virgin birth, our mother and her son were divinized. And without the slightest difficulty, Jesus emerged from his mother's womb while from the divine nature that was united to their human nature, overflowed in an excess of love. In, order, in other words, these two purest bodies were transformed into light. And without the slightest impediment, Jesus, the light, emerged from the light of his mother, 
without the slightest change to their human nature, but preserving it whole and intact. And then they return to their natural state. So here Louisa is describing a beautiful portrait of what it looked like at the moment of Jesus' birth in this cave. Their bodies glowed like those of Adam and Eve before sin, whereby the creator of light emerged from the created light of Mary. And after this beautiful virgin miraculous birth of Christ, resume their normal appearance with a light went back within them. She adds, who could describe the beauty of the little baby Jesus, who at the moment of his birth transmitted, even externally, the rays of his divinity? Who could narrate the beauty of his mother, who was completely absorbed in those divine rays? And it seemed to me that St. Joseph was not present at the moment of Jesus' birth, but remained in another corner of the cave completely absorbed in this profound mystery. And if Joseph did not see the event with his, the eyes of his body, he could see very well with the eyes of his soul as he was enraptured in a state of sublime ecstasy. Now in the act in which the little baby Jesus came into this world, I wanted to fly to him and take him in my arms, but the angels prevented me from doing so, telling me that the honor of holding him belonged first to his mother. Now this makes me laugh when I read this, because Louisa was very much like that, you know? She was like all or nothing. If I'm going to love Jesus, I'm going to want all of him back. All of his love that, that he received from me, I wanted back too. <laughs> Here I'm picturing Louise almost taking the baby Jesus from Mary. <laughs> and then Louisa adds, Then the Most Holy Virgin, as though stirred, returned from the state of ecstasy to her normal state, and from the hands of the angel, received her son into her arms. In her ardent love, she squeezed him tightly, so tightly that it seemed as if she wished to draw him back into her womb. Then in wanting her ardent love to pour forth, she placed him at her bosom to suckle. In the meantime, I was left utterly speechless, waiting to be called this time so as not to be scolded again by the angels. Then the heavenly queen said to me, Come, come and take your beloved, and delight in him as well. Pour out your love to him. As she said this, I drew close to my mother, and she gave him to me into my arms. Who could describe my joy, the kisses, the hugs, and such tenderness? After I poured out my love a bit, I said to him, my beloved, you are sucked. You have sucked the milk of our mother, share it with me. And he, with complete humility, poured part of that milk from his mouth into mine and said, My beloved, I was conceived united with suffering. I was born into suffering, and I died in suffering. And with the three nails with which they crucified me, I nailed the three powers of the soul, the intellect, the memory, and the will. Of those who yearn to love me, whence I keep them completely drawn to me. For sin impaired these three powers and separated them without measure from their creator. And as he was saying this, he gazed upon the world and began to cry over its misery. On seeing him cry, I said, Loving infant Jesus, don't sadden with your tears a night so happy for the one who loves you. Instead of pouring ourselves out and crying, let us pour ourselves out in joyful song. And as I said this, I began to sing. Jesus was delighted on hearing me sing. And 
he stopped crying. And completing my verse, he sang his own verse with a voice so powerful and harmonious that all other angelic voices ceased at the sound of his most sweet voice. Another Christmas reflection is taken from volume 25, December 16th, 1928. Louisa Wright. While meditating on this day in which there begins the novena to the baby Jesus, I was thinking about the nine excesses of his incarnation, which he had narrated to me with so much tenderness and which are written in the first volume. I felt great reluctance in reminding the confessor about this because in reading them, he had told me that he wanted to read them in public in our chapel. Now, while I was thinking of this, my little baby Jesus appeared in my arms, so very little, caressing me with his tiny little hands and saying to me, how beautiful is my little daughter, how beautiful, how I thank you for having listened to me. And I replied, my love, what are you saying? Is it I whom... It is I who must thank you for speaking to me and for giving me with so much love. And as my own teacher, the many lessons I did not deserve. And Jesus said, Oh, my daughter, how I long to speak, and yet souls do not listen, not even to what your tender mother wishes to tell you. They reduce me to silence and stifle my flames of love. So we must thank each other. You thank me, and I thank you. And why do you want to oppose the public reading of the nine excesses of my love? You do not know how much life, love, and grace they contain. My word is creative, and in narrating to you the nine excesses of my incarnate love, I not only renew the love I had in incarnating myself, but I create new love to envelop souls and win them over. With these nine excesses of my love, revealed with so much loving tenderness and simplicity, I formed the prelude to the many lessons I would give you on my divine fiat, which would serve to establish its kingdom in you. So in reading them, my love is renewed and redoubled. Don't you want my love to be redoubled? To issue forth from me and invest other hearts, so that receiving the prelude of my enveloping love, they might dispose themselves of the lessons of my will and make it known and reign. Afterwards, the confessor was reading in the chapel the first excess of Jesus' love at the Incarnation. <laughs> this makes me a little bit laugh, chuckle, because Louisa did not want initially the confessor to do this, to read these nine excesses of love that transpired only between she and Jesus. But after Jesus' gentle reprimand, she writes, afterwards the confessor was reading the chapel of the first excesses of Jesus' love, so she conceded Jesus' request. And my sweet Jesus in my interior attuned his ears to listen in. Drawing me to himself, he said, My daughter, how happy I am in listening to them. My happiness increases in keeping you in the house of my will, as both of us are listeners. I listen to what I have revealed to you, and you listen to what you have heard from me. My love expands, is set ablaze, and unleashes itself. Listen, listen how beautiful it is. A word contains breath, and in being spoken, the word carries that breath, which, like air, goes round from mouth to mouth and communicates the power of my creative word. And the new creation which my word contains descends into the hearts of men. Listen, my daughter. In redemption, I have the company of my apostles, and among them I was pure love in instructing them. I spared no toil, 
to form the foundation of my church. Now in this house, I feel the company of the first children of my will. I feel my loving scenes being repeated as I see you as pure love among them, wanting to impart lessons of my divine fiat to form the foundations of the kingdom of my will. If you knew how happy I am in seeing you speak about my divine will, I eagerly await the moment when you begin to speak, and when you speak, I listen to you, and I experience the happiness my divine will conveys. The next reflection is taken from volume 25, December 21st, 1928. Louisa writes, As I continue the novena of Holy Christmas and listen to Jesus' interior voice on the nine excesses of the Incarnation, my beloved Jesus drew me to himself and showed me how each excess of his love was a sea without boundaries. From the sea arose gigantic waves in which one could see all souls devoured by his loving flames. Just as the fish swim in the waters of the sea, and the waters of the sea sustain not just the life of the fish, but direct, protect, nourish, rest, and delight the fish to the point that if they exist, the, they can, the sea, they can say, our life is ended because we have left our inheritance, the homeland given to us by our Creator. In the same way, these immense waves of Jesus' loving flames, which rose from those seas of his divine fire in enveloping souls, seek to be the light, guide, protection, nourishment, rest, and homeland of souls. But as souls exit from the sea of love, at once they find death. Jesus once said, Should not the sea cry, I would cry, and seeing that while my love has devoured all souls, they ungratefully refuse to live in my sea of love. Rather, resting themselves free of my divine flames, they exile themselves from my homeland, thereby losing their guidance, protection, sustenance, rest, and even life. Souls emerged from me. They were created by me. And they were enveloped by my divine flames of love that unleashed when incarnating myself for love of them all. As I hear the narration of these nine excesses, the sea of love, of my love expands. It is set ablaze and forms immense waves that roar so loudly as to captivate everyone's attention. It does so to make them heed nothing other than my moans of love, my cries of sorrow, and my repeated sobs that exclaim, Don't make me weep anymore. Let us exchange the kiss of peace. Let us love each other, and we shall all be happy, the Creator and the creature. Well, after having read, read that, I will share just a brief little passage from one of Hannibal's letters on Christmas. Um, it was from Hannibal to Louisa, from February 14th, 1927, written when he was in Messina, and sent to her in Corrado, when she, where she was bedridden. And then I will share with you the nine excesses of love that Jesus, Jesus just spoke about, where he tells us that each word of these excesses of love creates souls, converts them, helps redeem them. Hannibal writes to Louisa in 1927, Most esteemed one in the Lord, in reading the nine excesses of Christmas in which we have already prepared the proofs for printing, one remains astounded at the immense love and suffering of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ for love of us and for the salvation of souls. I have never read 
in any other book on this topic, a revelation so touching and compelling. Now the nine excesses of love that prepare us for the birth of Christ. Day one. With my mind, Louisa writes, I brought myself to paradise for one hour and with my imagination envisioned the most holy trinity. The Father sending the Son to earth, the Son promptly obeying the Father's will, and the Holy Spirit consenting to the Son's incarnation. In contemplating such a great mystery, my mind was perplexed, for I beheld a love so requiting, so consistent, and so powerful among the three of them and toward mankind that I was overwhelmed. Then I beheld the ingratitude of men, and especially of my own country. I would have remained there not for an hour, but for the whole day. But an interior voice told me, This is enough for now. Come and behold other greater excesses of love. Day two. The second excess of love. Louisa Wright. Then my mind brought itself into the Virgin Mary's womb, and in considering Jesus, I was left completely speechless upon beholding a God so great in heaven. And yet, now, so utterly helpless, restricted and constrained, that he hasn't the ability to so much as move or where he can barely breathe. The interior voice then said to me, do you see how much I have loved you? Oh, please, make a little space for me in your heart. Remove from yourself all that which opposes me, and in this way you will allow me to breathe and move more freely in my mother's womb. With my heart inflamed, I asked Jesus' forgiveness and promised him that I would give myself completely over to him. I wept profusely, but I say this to my embarrassment. I would then go back to behaving as I did with my usual defects. Oh, Jesus, how good you are with this wretched soul. Day three, the third excess of love. Louisa writes. As I proceeded from the second to the third meditation, an interior voice said to me, My child, place your head upon the womb of my mother, and peer deep within and behold my little humanity. My love devoured me, my divine flames, divine oceans, divinely immense seas of love inundated me, completely consumed me, and unleashed flames that were so high that they overwhelmed and enveloped everyone, all human generations, from the first to the last man. My little humanity was devoured by my divine flames. Compelled as I was by the divine flames of my eternal love, do you know what it is that I set ablaze? Ah, souls. I was satisfied only after I had conceived all souls within me at the moment of my conception and enveloped them in my divine flames of love. I was God, and if I was to operate as God, I had to set all souls ablaze. My love would have afforded me no peace had I excluded so much as one soul. Ah, my daughter. Peer well into the womb of my mother. Fix well your eyes on my conceived humanity. And you will find your soul conceived within me and the flames of my love enveloping you. Oh, how much I loved you and love you still. I was completely overwhelmed in the face of so much love and unable to detach myself from it when a voice called me loudly saying, my daughter, this is nothing. 
cleave to me more tightly and give me your hands. Give them to my dear mother so that she may press you to my motherly womb. Behold anew my little humanity that has just been conceived. And behold, the fourth excess of my love. Day four. Jesus reveals to Louisa, my child, now that you have contemplated my devouring love, behold my operating love. Each soul that I conceived within my conception brought me the burden of its sins, its weakness, and its passions. Whence my love compelled me to take up the burden of each one of them. My love conceived not only souls, but the sorrows of each soul, as well as the satisfaction each soul is required to offer my heavenly Father. So my passion was conceived along with my humanity. Fix your eyes well on me in the womb of my heavenly mother. Oh, how tortured my little humanity is. Take a good look at my little head, surrounded with a crown of thorns, which pressed tightly around my temples, made rivers of tears pour out from my eyes. I am unable to move in the slightest way to dry them. Oh, please, unite yourself to my passion. You whose arms are free, dry my eyes from so much crying. These thorns are the crown of the many evil thoughts that fill human minds. Oh, how they pierce me more than the thorns the earth produces. Oh, behold the long crucifixion of nine months in which I can move neither my hands nor my feet. I cannot so much as move a finger. I remain continuously immobile and there isn't any room for me to make the slightest motion. What a long and hard crucifixion. And what is more, here with me, there are all the evil works of souls that assume the form of nails, which continuously pierce my hands and feet. Jesus continued to narrate one sorrow after another. All the martyrdoms of his little humanity were so numerous that it would take too long to describe them all. Whence I burst into tears and hurt in my interior. My daughter, I wish to hug you, but am unable to do so, as there is no room for me to move. My immobility restrains me from doing so. I want to approach you, but I am unable to walk. For now? You may approach me and hug me. Later, when I emerge from my mother's womb, I will approach you. But as I hugged him and pressed him tightly to my heart with my imagination, an interior voice told me, This is enough for now. My child, proceed to consider the fifth excess of love. Day five. Louisa writes. The interior voice continued. My child, do not distance yourself from me. Do not leave me alone. My love seeks your company. This is yet another excess of my love in not wanting to be alone. Do you know whose company it is that I seek? I seek the company of the soul's love. Behold, all souls along with me in the womb of my mother, conceived together with me, and I am here for them in the form of pure love. I wish to tell them how much I love them. I wish to speak with them, to tell them of my joys and sorrows. I wish to tell them how I have come to dwell with them, to console them and make them happy that I will remain with each and every one of them as their little brother to convey to them at the cost of my life all of my blessings and my kingdom. 
I wish to offer them my kisses and my loving finesses. I wish to delight in them, but alas, how many sorrows they cause me. Some flee from me, while others play death and force me into silence. Some despise my blessing and care not for my kingdom, while others requite my kisses and loving finesses with indifference and become completely estranged to me. Though I am among so many, oh, how lonely I am. Oh, how much this loneliness weighs upon me. I have no one with whom to share one word, with whom to pour myself out, not even in love. I remain continuously downcast, without anyone with whom to speak. Or if I do speak, I am ignored. Alas, daughter, I beg you, I implore you, do not leave me alone in such utter loneliness. Grant me the pleasure of allowing me to speak by listening to me. Lend your ear to my teachings. I am the master of masters. How many things I wish to teach you. If you only listen closely to what your tender mother wishes to tell you, you will stop my crying. And I will rejoice in you. Do you not wish for me to rejoice in you? As I abandoned myself in Jesus, uniting myself to his passion in his state of loneliness, the interior voice continued. Enough, enough for now. Proceed to consider the sixth excess of my love. Day six. Jesus reveals to Louisa. My child, come and entreat my dear mother to set aside a little space for you within her motherly womb so that you may see for yourself the sorrowful state in which I find myself. And in my mind's eye, Louisa writes, it seemed as if our Holy Queen made a little room for me in order to make Jesus happy. And she placed me in her womb. But the darkness was so thick that I could not see him. I could only hear his breathing. He continued to say in my interior, My child, behold yet another excess of my love. I am eternal light. The sun is but a pale shadow of my light. Do you see where my love led me? Do you see in what a dark prison I am? It is not a glimmer of light. It is always night for me, but a night without stars or rest, while I remain always awake. What pain! The narrow confines of this prison keep me from making the slightest movement. They keep me in the thick darkness. Even my breathing is impaired. As I breathe through the breathing of my mother and how labored it is. And this is compounded by the darkness of the sins of souls. Each sin is a night for me which when joined together form an abyss of darkness without boundaries. What pain. Oh, the excess of my love, it compels me to go from the immensity of light and space into an abyss of thick darkness that is so narrow that I haven't the freedom to breathe. And all this for love of souls. And as he was speaking, he moaned, but his moans were stifled because of the lack of space, and he wept. I was immersed in weeping. I thanked him and offered him my compassion. With my love, I wanted to offer him some light, as he had asked me to. But who can recount all that which had transpired? 
Then the same interior voice added, This is enough for now. Proceed to consider the seventh excess of my love. Day seven. Louisa writes, the interior voice continued. My daughter, don't abandon me amid so much loneliness and in so much darkness. Don't leave the womb of my mother. Remain and behold the seventh excess of love. In the womb of my heavenly mother, I enjoyed complete bliss. There was no blessing that I did not possess. Joy, enthrallments, everything was at my disposal. The angels adored me reverently, hanging upon my every word. Oh, the excess of my love. I could say that such an excess made me change my destiny. It led me to the point of being restrained within this gloomy prison. It stripped me of all my joys, bliss, and blessings, and clothed me with the whole gamut of the soul's poor plight. And all this in order to requite souls by giving them my destiny, my joys, and my eternal bliss. But this would have been nothing if I did not find and expiate in souls their great ingratitude and obstinate betrayals. Oh, how shocked my eternal love was before so much ingratitude, and how I wept over mankind's callousness and betrayals. Ingratitude was the sharpest thorn to pierce my heart from the moment of my conception to the last moment of my life. Look at my little heart. It is wounded and pours forth blood. What pain, what torture I experience. My daughter, do not be ungrateful to me. Ingratitude is the greatest sorrow for your Jesus. It is closing the door in my love, in my face, and leaving me outside numb in the cold. And yet, my love did not stop in the face of so much ingratitude but assume the role of interceding, imploring, moaning, and begging for love, which forms the eighth excess of my love. Day eight. Jesus reveals to Louisa, my child, don't abandon me, but place your head upon the womb of my dear mother and you will hear, even from the outside, my moans and supplications. In seeing that neither my moans nor supplications of love move souls to offer me any solace, I behave like the poorest of beggars, who, stretching out his little hand, asks out of pity at least alms for the good of their own souls for their affections and the love in their hearts. My love wants to win over the hearts of men at any cost. In seeing that after seven excesses of my love, man was still reluctant in corresponding to my love, he played deaf, neither caring for me nor wishing to entrust himself to me. My love excelled. My love should have ceased to pour itself out, but no, it wanted to overflow from its boundaries more abundantly. And so from the womb of my mother, my love extended my voice to every heart in the most insinuating of manners, with the most fervent prayers, and with the most penetrating words. And do you know what I said to souls? My child. Give me your heart. I will give you everything you desire, so long as you give me your heart in exchange. I have come down from heaven to seize this heart of yours. Oh, please do not deny me this. Do not dash my hopes. 
in seeing man reluctant to the point of many souls turning their backs to me, I then began to moan. Joining my little hands and weeping with such stifled sobs, I added, Oh, I am but a little beggar, and do you not wish to give me your heart, not even as alms? Is this not a greater excess of my love? that the creator in his desire to approach man should take the form of a little babe to avoid striking fear in him, that he should ask for man's heart at least as alms, and in seeing him refuse, implore, moan, and weep. Then I heard him say, And do you not wish to offer me your heart? Or perhaps you too want me to moan and beg and cry for you to give me your heart. Do you wish to deny me the alms I ask? And as, I was, as he was saying this, I heard him as though sobbing. So I said, Oh my Jesus, do not cry. I give you my heart and my entire being. Then the interior voice continued. Proceed further. Continue on to the ninth excess of my love. Day nine. Jesus reveals, my child, my state is increasingly sorrowful. If you love me, keep your gaze fixed on me to see if you can offer your Jesus some relief. A little word of love. A caress or a kiss will console me in my crying and in my afflictions. My child, after I offered to man my eight excesses of love and he requited them so badly, my love did not cease, but strove to add to the eighth a ninth excess. And this ninth excess are the yearnings, the sighs of fire, the flames of desire that caused me to emerge from my mother's womb and embrace man. These surgings of love overwhelmed my little humanity, not yet born, to such an agonizing state that I reached the point of breathing my last. And as I was about to breathe my last, my divinity that is inseparable from my humanity infused in me small inhalations of a life. And so I regained life to continue my agonizing state and return again to the point of death. Such is the ninth excess of my love, to agonize and to die of love continuously for souls. Oh, what a long agony of nine months. Oh, how love smothered me and made me die. Had I not possessed the divinity within my humanity, which infused life in me every time I was about to die, love would not have consumed me before coming into this world. Then he added, look at me and listen closely, how I agonize, how my heart pounds, pants, and burns. Behold me in the very moment I die. And he remained in deep silence. I felt like dying, my blood froze in my veins, and trembling I said to him, My love and my life, do not die, do not leave me alone. You desire love, I will love you. I will not leave you ever again. Offer me your divine flame so that I may love you more and be completely consumed for love of you. This concludes the Christmas novena that Louisa composed at the age of 17 and that she continued to recite every Christmas season for the rest of her life. So as we approach Christmas, let us devote special time to contemplating the nine excesses of Jesus' love. This is something the world does not consider, nor the church. 
the church rightly so celebrates the virgin birth of Christ and that he came into this world to embrace the cross in order to fulfill scripture and to open up the gates of heaven and send forth the Holy Spirit. But in none of the readings do we ever hear of Jesus suffering in the womb of Mary during Christmas. None of the gospel readings, none of the readings of the Old Testament. So this is something that the Lord is calling upon those souls who have ears to hear. And simply because the church does not emphasize the passion of Christ in the womb of Mary in preparation for the Christmas feast, doesn't mean the church is to be blamed. No, the church is not aware of this. This has been revealed in these end times. That is this knowledge of the divine will and how it operated in the baby Jesus in the womb of Mary. The Holy Spirit has chosen to reserve this knowledge for the end times. But those who have been chosen to come across these writings have been handpicked by the Blessed Mother and by Jesus. It's not by chance or coincidence that you come across the writings of Louisa nor this Christmas Novena that very few will know. I would say 1% of the world's population knows this, actually less than 1%. Imagine the great good you could do for 99 plus of the world's population that knows nothing about Christ's neonatal passion or prenatal passion or both, right? Let us multiply our novena on behalf of those who are not aware of it and offer Jesus that consolation he yearns for as a beggar. He is completely ignored in these nine months in the womb of his mother. And he's begging the world to give him attention, affection, love, compassion, gratitude, recompense. So you are chosen by God and Mary to receive this beautiful novena and to recite it on behalf of all. Mary makes this very clear in the work she dictated to Louisa at the foot of Louisa's bed in the afternoon, entitled The Blessed Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will. In the opening pages of this book, Mary dictates to Louisa, she says that you receive this book directly from heaven. I'm paraphrasing, of course. So you were destined to receive this book, and your names, because of this, are inscribed in my maternal heart with letters of gold, with characters of gold. So God has predestined you to receive this novena, as Mary has predestined you by God to receive this work of her life. So in Thanksgiving, I would recommend that you do what I am going to do for Christmas. I do Mass daily, and I'm going to offer up Mass in Thanksgiving to the infant Jesus for the nine months he spent in the womb in suffering, sorrow, pain, and agony, but out of great love for mankind. Because of his great love, there was a joy in that suffering and sorrow. But that doesn't dismiss our responsibility from giving him reparation in that suffering and sorrow. So I will offer up Mass, and I encourage you to do the same. Offer up a Mass in thanksgiving to the infant Jesus for having endured all this abandonment on the part of souls for centuries, for 2,000 millennia, and it still goes on. And he will derive a great consolation, comfort, and you will do an immense good to the heart of Christ and the heart of Mary for compensating on behalf of those who are not aware of his passion in the womb. Thank you for joining in, my brothers and sisters in Christ. May God bless you and always keep you united with him as we prepare for Christmas. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This confusion in the church today is precipitated by opportunists. 
people that take advantage. Paul alluded to this when he spoke of an apostasia in Greek, which is really a rebellion on the part of the masses against the church. We are living in those times today. And this provides an opportunity for opportunist promoters of false messages, apocalyptic messages, blogs, websites. Some of them are well-intentioned, I'm sure. But others are less well-intentioned. Some will use this as an opportunity on which to make a killing monetarily. You know, there's an old saying in the media business, if it bleeds, it leads. These Catholic websites have followed suit. Whatever is the most violent and gory is getting the most attention. There are many lay promoters claiming to be experts and refusing guidance from authorities within the mystical theology space. They avail themselves of the vulnerability and the naivete of the faithful who are looking for this spirit of leadership. Now, Enter the opportunists, a.k.a. false promoters of false apocalyptic messages. And these people feed off of the naivete and the vulnerability of the little ones of whom our Lord spoke in Matthew 18. Woe to those of you who mislead these little ones. Better for a millstone to be tied around his neck and thrown into the lake.